Welcome to Cornerstone Online. We are excited you decided to join us today. If you would like to join us in person, we are holding services each week at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. We would like to thank you for your continued generosity during this time. To give online, download the Give Plus app or follow the Give Online link on our website. Thanks again for listening today. We hope to see you in person soon. Think of somebody that you greatly admire, somebody that you respect, someone that you love a lot, you really appreciate this person, and now think about what it is that this person has. What is there about this person that causes you to have that high esteem of them? You know, the one thing that I believe makes people attractive to us is their attitude. More than, I mean, there are, there are other factors, but I think the thing that most makes us think, wow, that, that person is a person I'd like to have my best friend. The thing that makes us feel that way is their attitude. Almost all the things that we admire about other people are attitudes. This person is positive. They, they are encouraging. They are kind. They're caring. They're loving. Whatever the attributes might be, we boil it down, and pretty much it, it's attitude that makes us respect and admire other people it isn't so much what the whatever skills they have it isn't how good looking they are nobody says wow this person is my best friend because they are just so good looking no nobody says that that means that either whether a person is good looking or not doesn't matter to you or that all your friends are ugly okay your attitude is what makes you attract not skills because nobody says, wow, the reason why I really like this person and they're my best friend is because they are so good at car timing. I mean, they, they can make a timing on, on a car just work out perfectly. No, mechanical ability is not what makes somebody our best friend. Our attitude helps us to be attractive to other people. And actually, your attitude also is looked at very carefully by God. The thing that makes you attractive to God is not how good looking you are, not your skills, because he gave those things to you originally anyway, and he can take them away. So that doesn't really matter to God. Granted, God loves everybody. Now don't, don't misunderstand and think, oh, I'm saying that, that some people aren't loved by God. We're all loved by God. But the Bible makes it very clear that God is always looking at our attitudes about a lot of different things in life. He values some attitudes very highly. Now, we all have an attitude about God. We have an attitude about the God, God's kingdom. We have an attitude about love and kindness and compassion, what is valuable in life, what is not valuable in life. And of course, the thing that is most pleasing to God when it comes to our attitude is when our attitude most closely aligns with his attitude or with the attitude of his son, Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Ephesians 4, 23 talks about being made new in our attitude, the attitude of our minds. And then Hebrews 4, 12 says that the word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of of our heart. And then Philippians 2 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Now, this kind of attitude goes against a lot of what our world chases after, things like power and wealth and influence. Management expert Peter Drucker said that for business growth to be sustained year after year after year, the leaders of the company have to be either crazy, crooked, or open to change based on their company's growth and the opportunities and challenges that expansion poses for them. Now, maybe you've seen a lot of success in your own personal life. Did that happen because you lived a crazy kind of life? Or you lived a crooked kind of life? 
The Bible has a better way. The Bible teaches us that we are to have an attitude of service, an attitude that values what is eternal rather than, than those things that are temporary, an attitude that we are managers here on this earth that belongs to God and we are good stewards of it. Jesus told a parable in Luke 15 that illustrates the crazy, crooked way that some people tend to live, this overcommitted, overspending attitude that a lot of people in our world have. And this isn't the primary teaching of this passage of Scripture, but it is a teaching that is there, and it shows us a little bit about the kind of attitude that we should have and also gives us a bad example of somebody that was pretty much a a fool when it came to the managing of money. Luke 15, 11 through 16. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anyone, anything, sorry. No one gave him anything. Now there are five critical mistakes that this young man made that would cause some to say that he was a financial fool. And the first is to overestimate the value of wealth. The son said, I want my share of the inheritance. Now, he may have been dreaming of this for a long time. And he knew that the way things worked back in those days was that his brother would get the largest share of the inheritance. So he understood that, but he knew, he knew that he would be getting some of the inheritance as well. Now, he may have fantasized about what he would do when he got his part of the inheritance and how he was going to strike out on his own. He was going to go to a faraway country and he was going to call his own shots and he wasn't going to have to uh, toe the line with his dad and his older brother and so on and so forth. And he thought about this. He had all these expectations about what it was going to be like. Well, it's a common theme in America that many Americans have this fantasy about getting rich. And you probably know somebody who has the attitude that money is really, really important and maybe more important than most other things in their life. But it isn't. It isn't. There are a lot of things that are more important than money. A good name, for example, Proverbs 22.1. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Or how about wisdom? Proverbs 3, 13 and 14, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. So Proverbs 23, 4 said, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. And then Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, the second thing that we see here is instant gratification. This young man went just a little bit crooked. Because, you know, to get an inheritance, that only happens when your parents are deceased. So he's wanting his inheritance, and he wants it now. And his dad doesn't oblige him by dying so that he can have his inheritance. So it's like, Dad, would you, would you please kick off so that I can get my inheritance and cooperate with me a little bit. So he, he wanted to inherit something someday, and he, he couldn't wait for that to happen. He had to have it now. It's sort of a, you know, play now, pay later. Skip school, call in sick to work, go fishing, do what you want to do. Blow it off. 
So people get so impulsive with a lot of things like experiences and clothes and cars and vacations. It's instant gratification. What makes me feel good right now? The desire for instant gratification is at the root of a lot of crookedness. It siphons off money, talent, skills, time from families and communities and the good that people could do with their resources. And then third, self-destructive behavior. What did he do? What did this young man do? He went a little bit crooked. He went a little bit crazy. He squandered his inheritance in wild living. His brother said prostitutes, which may or may not have been true. He went off the deep end in all the ways that people do when they squander their lives. Sin Sin is expensive. I mean, it may be fun for a while. That instant gratification thing, yeah, it's, it's there for a while. It's self-destructive, though. It's going to cost you. It's going to hurt you. As the old saying goes, the chickens are going to come home to roost. It will cost you time. It will cost you money. It will cost you relationships. It will cost you jobs because of alcohol, drugs, gambling, porno, maintaining affairs, lawyers, detectives, alimony, child support. It's a downward spiral into a kind of prison. This young man loved to party, party hardy, have a good time. This is what happened. He learned the truth of Proverbs 23, 21, which says, for drunkards and gluttons, Become poor. Self-destructive behavior will get you every time. And then fourth, overindulgence. You spend more than you have. You burn the candle at both ends. You play when you should be working. Now the older generation, I'm not talking about my generation, I'm talking about the generation before me. The older generation learned some hard lessons. They, they learn that you save for a rainy day. They learn that when you're out of money, you're out of money. But today, life and credit is a lot easier. At first, okay, at first it is. The average American credit card holder owes $6,849 on his or her credit card. Five, being unprepared for the storms. So the prodigal son didn't really count on running out of money. He didn't count on the country that he went to experiencing hard times. Like we don't really count on tragedy striking when we overcommit ourselves. We don't really think about how our children might become alienated from us. We spend our money before we have it. And then we're counting on every single dollar coming in. And we don't count on being stopped for speeding and we don't count on it being in a construction zone and we don't count on just so happens we weren't wearing our seat belt at the time so you work more or maybe you get another job and you you feel trapped because you are that's how it happens and how do you get out how do you get a better attitude about what is valuable and what is eternal and what is right and what is wrong well, you start by admitting your character flaw. Overspending, greed, workaholism. All these things reveal something about us. It reveals something about, I hate to say it, but our government too. Where you look at administration after administration after administration and they just keep spending and spending and spending and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing like there's no tomorrow, only there is going to be a tomorrow, and, and there is going to be a reckoning. And maybe, maybe it's envy that's the problem. Maybe it's a lack of patience. You know, we've maybe, maybe we've never learned to be content. We've never learned that magical word that can set us free, which is the word enough. I have enough. I've done enough. I've committed enough. Maybe it's a lack of trust in God, fearful that he isn't going to provide for us. Here's a question for you to consider. Has God blessed you? 2 Samuel chapter 12. 
God is telling David, who has sinned with Bathsheba, had an adulterous affair, arranged for her husband to be killed so he could have her as his wife. And God is, God is talking to David. And God, God is saying, hey, I gave you this and this and this and this. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you more. So why did you do this thing that is detestable to me? Let God give you all the blessings that he wants to give you. And let him do it in his time. His timing. If you choose the way of overdoing it and overspending and overindulgence and greed, these are the results. Number one, you'll be in bondage to the people that you owe. You have to keep working all those jobs to make sure you're paying for all the mistakes that you made. And you better earn it. And you better earn it consistently. And there better not be a problem. And you better not get laid off because... You have to have things line up for you now. You're frantically working and maybe in the process you're neglecting your family and the things that you really need along the way. Second, it undermines your joy in this life. How do you enjoy Christmas? How do you enjoy a vacation? How do you enjoy a simple night out when all the time you're thinking, I really shouldn't be doing this. I really can't afford this. I really shouldn't be doing this. How do you enjoy being a mother or a father when you know that the one thing your children really want and need from you is you, time with you? But you can't spend that time because you've overcommitted yourself in some way or another. Number three, it erodes your giving opportunities. Almost every Christian realizes that there are things they would like to do. They would, they would like to help other people. And the Bible talks about, quite a bit, it talks about the idea of making money so that you have enough for your own needs, but also to share with other people. And so there is within almost every Christian this desire to reach out and when you see a need, to help people that are in need. But if we're overcommitted, it steals from us the opportunity to be able to help other people, to use our our gifts and our skills for other people because we, we don't have the time to do that. We don't have the money to do that. There's just no way, this is, there's, this is no way for us to live the way of the prodigal son. So what did the prodigal son do? Well, it says in Scripture that he came to his senses. He came to his senses. And that is why the Bible has So many illustrations, so many teachings about this alternative God of money, material things. Because it is so tempting to put that above the one true God. So what did this young man do when he came to his senses? What do we do when we come to our senses? Well, what he did was he went back to his father in humility and he confessed to him. And what should we do? There are times when we need to go to our Heavenly Father and say, help me make a new start. I've gone the wrong direction. I've veered off course. I've not been following Jesus the way I need to be following Jesus. Help me get back on track. Help me make a new start. Let's bow in prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much for these examples that you give us in Scripture. There's so many ways for us to steer our life in the wrong direction. Slightly, maybe, at first, but then more and more gradually, we just seem to get further and further away from you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bring us back. I pray that you'll help us to see the truth of Scripture. And for these truths that we've studied, Lord, I pray that that will help us to change our attitude that our attitude might be like that of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.